So what is a transformer? A transformer is not what we see in the movies, okay, although it might look a lot more impressive. A transformer is what you see on the right hand side and it is, although not that impressive, very valuable to us. Why? Because it's a very essential device in our distribution system. What, what it can do is it, it can convert or the, what the name comes from, transform AC voltage magnitudes of any value from a power source, source to a desired value for what you need either for distribution or consumption. And it's only for changing the magnitudes of AC voltage. We cannot use it for varying DC voltages. We're first uh, changing them to an AC voltage. Why do we use transformers? Okay, the bulk of our power is generated in the form of generators, uh, which can be thermal, hydro, or nuclear. But due to the equipment sizing and your insulation, the voltage that we generate at is anything between 15 and 25 kilovolts. And the power is megawatts. Now, the current magnitude, if we want to distribute it at this voltage, will be very high. And it means that it will involve a lot of losses. We will have transmission power loss. We will have large size conductors. We will have voltage drop in our distribution system. So that's why we need to step it up before we start distributing that. So we step it up to 220 to 800 kilovolts. So reducing the losses and then we have nominal size conductors. And then once we get to the industry of utilities, we step them down again. Now, in terms of operation, similar to pr the production of magnetic fuel by the flow of external cur current, this uh, field also produces an electrical force when it's in the vicinity of a good conductor. And this is called electromotive force. Now, we can also further classify this as dynamically induced EMF or statically induced EMF. Now, the first one is what we use in our generators. And the second one is what we use in our transformer. So dynamically, so if we have a conductor rotating within a magnetic field, there will then be a current flowing through it and there will be a certain force applied to that. So that is the fundamental principle of electrical generators. When we have a prime mover and that's used to rotate the rotor in that magnetic field. Statically induced is when we have a static conductor and the magnetic flux is about to pass near the vicinity and a, a transformer is based on this. Now this induced MF can be um, classified as the mutually induced MF. That is when we have a static conductor with an external magnetic flux produced by another coil or it can be self-induced MF in the same conductor. So we use both of that in the, um, the transformer itself. Now if we have a coil with n amount of turns and that it's carrying a current I, it produces a certain flux and the coefficient of that is self-inductance. When we have two coils around the common medium, then the magnetic field produced by the first coil when you have current flowing through it, induce a mutual inductance in the second coil, and that's expressed by the letter M. So just as we have in our electrical terms, we have voltage, current, and resistance. We have MMF, magnetomotive force, similar to EMF. We have magnetic flux, similar to current. We have permeability, simil similar to conductivity and reluctance similar to resistance in a normal electrical circuit. So higher permeability material is required for a higher magnetic flux. That's why we have special materials for our transformer. So normally we will have a transformer, two conductors, one on the primary, one on the secondary side, and that's wound uh, around a single limb. 
And the total EMF induced in the secondary divided by that in the primary is the EMF per turn times the amount of turns on both the primary and the secondary. So if that EMF per turn is the same, then it reduces to N2 over N1. Primary current, uh, if we say it's very small in the open circuit conditions, so that your applied voltage is almost equal and opposite to the EMF induced in the primary, then we can say V2 over V1 is equal to N2 over N1. And also, secondary output power is almost equal to the primary input power. Then we can say V1 times I1 cos theta is equal to V2 times I2 cos uh, theta 2. Power factors are almost equal. And that's why we then end up with the formulas that we use to design a transformer. Input voltage over output voltage and the amount of turns input over output and then you'll see it just swaps around for the current because we would normally increase the voltage and that will decrease the current or the other way around. So your primary ampere turns is equal to the secondary ampere turns given to you by this formula. So if you just rewrite those two on the right hand side. Now we have an EMF equation for transformer. So the rate of change of flux is 2 times pi f, the flux, and the RMS is the peak divided by the square root of 2. And that is then 4.44 times the frequency times the flux. So the voltage induced in the primary gives us then a formula, 4.44, and that's for a sine wave times the amount of turns, the frequency, and the flux. And then similar for the voltage induced in the secondary. And if we then rewrite that, we can then have E, which is then the volts per turn. Uh, that's E divided by N, 4.44. As I said, that's for a sine wave, a constant. Then we have a B, M, and A. We've now changed flux by using the flux density and the net cross-sectional area, and then we still have the frequency. So now we have a formula. We can go and select the core type. We can go and select the flux density, and we can start to calculate the amount of turns that we need. Now the transformer core is a magnetic material, which then links primary and secondary, and it can have a variety of shapes and forms. different. Um, types that we can buy and use. Then we, the, in terms of core, we have core type transformers, which is the most commonly the one that we use. So there's the core type. You see the windings go around the limbs. And then we have shell type that we are used in furnace transformers. And then you can see now the core goes around the um, turns. So that's why we call it a shell type. The windings itself is made out of electrolytical grade copper. And then the metallic parts for 50 hertz is made out of steel, but laminated steel. So because we work with mag magnetic circuit, permeability is important. And plain, in plain language, permeability means how easy a material can be magnetized. So, and that's important if we talk about magnetic circuits. And we have a formula which gives us the flux density over um, the, the um, um, okay, this again is relative to voltage, this is relative to current. So there's a certain point where a higher flux density, you'll see the, the graph just now, um, that will not increase even, doesn't matter how much we increase then the amount of current that's flowing through it. So but that's for the magnetic circuit. So that is our, as what we call it, the BH curve. 
So this is the flux density, and you can see we, we have a point over here that doesn't matter how much you increase H, there is about zero increase in your flux density, and that is what we call saturation. So you want to operate your transformer in the linear region and not in the saturation point. So that's why you select a flux density so that your transformer operates in the linear region and not where it saturates. Of course, the moment it saturates, you basically just burn out the transformer. Okay, so I, I, or H is the magnetizing force. Okay, so there's just another graph. Uh, we just looked at one part of the graph just now, to the top part. But as you can see, we've got some hysteresis. So even with H going to zero, there's still some flux density. And this amount of uh, that's left is the hysteresis. So that will also determine, uh, because you have to remove that every time, that will also determine the losses in your transformer. So this hysteresis loop is formed when H completes a full cycle, as you can see, from positive to negative. So that changes with respect to the material that you use. Okay, so that's on the um, material and the material characteristics. Now the vector or phasor diagram gives us the voltages and the currents, currents at no load and at load conditions. And we have that to get a, get a better picture of what happens inside a transformer. The magnetic flux induces the EMF in both the primary and the secondary. And in the primary winding, the EMF is then turned at back EMF. And in an ideal situation, it, will, it would oppose the applied voltage so that there's no flow of current. Okay, but we have losses, so there's never no current flowing. So there you can see we have V1, which is the primary terminal voltage. Then we have minus E1, which is the primary induced EMF. Then on the secondary side, we have the secondary induced EMF, E2. We have the difference here between primary terminal voltage and induced EMF, which is the resistance voltage drop due to the fact that we have current flow. So that's why they are not exactly the same. We have a maximum value of the magnetic flux, Fm. We have the primary no load current, I0. We have the primary core loss current, IC and we have the primary magnetizing current, IM. So that gives you then a picture. Then cos F0, which is that angle over there, is the primary no load power factor. Okay, so there is a power factor that you also take into account, depending on the difference, the phase difference between the voltage and the current. So the output rating is expressed in MVA, megavolts, amps, or kilovolts, amps. And the single phase transformer, the output is given uh, voltage times current. No problem, um, Travis. And that's the formula that we have looked at previously. So this part of the formula, that was a V over N or E over N. And we just multiply it now by the current, uh, with the current. And for free phase, we just have to add the square root of three to determine the transformer rating. Now the transformer has got the equivalent circuit. So we've got resistance and reactance. So there's resistance, reactance on the primary, as well as on the secondary side. The fact that we've got uh, the square of A over here is because we've now actually transformed the voltage from the primary to the secondary. You've seen we've taken out the transformer itself. That's why we that will be that A square will then be the terms ratio that we have to multiply by. There's a free phase transformer, and 
we have a star connected primary ABC, which is now capital letters. And then on the secondary, you'll see it's small letters. And that is then, um, so on, it's delta connected on the primary side and star connected on the secondary side. There's the connection uh, to ground, the neutral connection. Now the main losses that we have is the core losses. So that is your eddy current and your hysteresis losses. So you see that hysteresis. Okay, so you select the correct material, you make that as small as possible, and that's constant, irrespective of the load. Then we have copper losses, which is the I squared R losses, which means that that will change as the current changes. Now the efficiency of the transformer, we determine it by looking at the output divided by the input, or 1 minus the losses over the input will then give us the efficiency. Now the efficiency of the transformer is normally very high. So in terms of maximum efficiency for a transformer, how would we achieve that? If you look at the at the losses, any idea from your side? How would we achieve maximum efficiency of the transformer? It is basically where if we can design a transformer that we can get the iron losses equal to the copper losses. Then we will have the most efficient transformer. Then regulation, because of the load impedance that changes, there is a drop in the secondary term, terminal voltage and we have to design because that would, would, must normally be within a speci specific um, uh, value or specification. And the copper losses is basically due to the resistive component when we have the load current flowing through it. Winding polarity is also important. Now normally it doesn't matter if I've got a sine wave and it's let's say the sine wave on the output side is now 180 degrees difference. Okay, but there is in some instances that it's important so we must know what is the polarity of the windings. And that will be normally indicated by a dot. Okay, sorry. So if, if this is the polarity, then if we have positive on that side, we will also have positive over here. So then if that's the case, then this waveform would look exactly the same as the input waveform if you display both on the oscilloscope. The high voltage windings, I've already indicated to you that the capital letters or in IEC it can be UVW and for single phase transformers A, 3A if there's a third winding um, for three phase transformers we use capital ABC and small letters ABC and again if we now use IEC and not NC then we'll go for UVW and this is an example of uh, such a transformer single phase there's the capital side, there's the small letters and the same for a three phase transformer. Then we have a polarity diagram, phase and polarity diagram. Now the first one is dy11, so you can see that's delta star, and 11 means that that's pointing to the clock 11, um, compared to the 12 o'clock position for the primary side. Now that means there's then a certain way that you have to connect the windings as shown on the right hand side and this one you can see now refers to 1 o'clock so that's delta um, star and that's why it's 1 or DIN1. Now depending if it's group 1, 2, 3 or 4 is a certain phase displacement. So in terms of clock number, we were just looking at uh, 11 o'clock, so that's a plus, plus 30 degrees, and 1 o'clock is minus 30 degrees. So there is 11 o'clock, there's 12 o'clock, and there's 1 o'clock, so you see this is then plus 30 degrees if it's 11 o'clock, and this is then minus 30 degrees if it's 
one o'clock. So that just gives you indication of fa uh, phaser and polarity diagrams. The delta star transformer, that's normally at the generator end, where we step up the voltages, and where single phase loads are to be fed on a secondary side between phase and neutral. So and then on the we will have a star connection on the secondary side. Star delta is where the line to line voltage is to be stepped down considerably with that introduction of the square root of free factor on the line to line voltage in the star connection. So the delta connection requires square root of three times more turns on each limb uh, to that of the star connection. And the star winding requires to carry square root of three times more current compared to the delta winding. Star-star connections disadvantage is the introduction of the third harmonic currents to the load. Advantage is that the insulation can be graded towards the neutral which makes the cost comparatively lower and for the star connected generators uh, on the primary side it eliminates distortions in the secondary voltage because you can in interconnect the neutrals of the generator and the star connected primary. Delta delta connections used in large power transformers for low voltage applications such as your insulation cost where insulation cost is not a major economical issue. Okay, let's just try again. Delta delta connections, large power rated transformers for low voltage applications. Uh, as the insulation cost is not a major economical issue because it's low voltage applications. The third harmonic current flows in the delta winding without flowing on the line side and the secondary voltage will have will not have any phase displacement with respect to the primary. So that's a delta delta connection. So delta delta connection on primary and secondary. Then we have zigzag connections and as the name tells you it's two sets of windings which are to be star connected and the interconnection between these set of windings is in different ways so that we introduce additional phase shift in part of the windings as per the drawing over here. And the zigzag connection is represented by this letter Z. So that's the reason if you need to introduce additional phase shift. Tertiary windings, um, so it's when the transform transformer has got a third winding, we adopt that in large size transformers and large switching substations and the additional third set of windings uh, is a to a three phase transformer is for provision of a delta connected tertiary winding to provide the path for that third harmonic to flow. Double secondary transformers and that's if you have to split the number of supplies from a high voltage feeder to in order to economize the quantity of high voltage switch gear and at the same time limit the fault level of the feeds to the low voltage switch gear. And the transformer is represented by a free terminal network. And typical values of impedance, your leakage reactants are then marked in this case. Then we have auto transformers which use a common winding for the primary and secondary. So there is one winding, depends on where you actually tap it off. And the disadvantage is that if there is interference it will just go straight through to the secondary side but it's economical in terms of cost in space, depending on your application. 